Well, hello there, and welcome to the Urban Gardener podcast. Uh, we help you in the Urban Gardener podcast turn up your gardening skills with timely tips and tricks for gardening in the city. I'm Josh Campbell, urban agriculture and natural resources educator, and I'm here with my friend Julia. And I'm Julia Laughlin, Oklahoma County horticulture educator, and Josh and I are partnering up to bring you this podcast. Yeah, so we're, we're here to talk, we're right at the doorstep of August, and we're here to talk about um, tips for August like we do every month. Um, but August is one of those months for me, sometimes I'm left kind of just scratching my head about what should be done. Yeah. A lot of times it's it's hot, it's dry, yeah. um, your plants are, are, you're just trying to kind of limp them along. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. But when I think about August, one thing that always happens in August and it always um, is on our minds in August is the fair, right? The county fair. Oklahoma County Free Fair. And this is the 108th. Wow, 108. 108, 108, 108 annual. Yep, yeah. there's our fair book. If those of you that are watching us on YouTube, it's bright and yellow and pretty. Yeah. And um, you can download it online on our website. But the Oklahoma County Free Fair is like any traditional fair. We have um, competitions in all areas of horticulture and, and also agriculture and animal science as well as in separate shows. But mm -hmm. the Free Fair itself is anything from a competition for a homeowner to bring in a house plant mm -hmm. and win a cash prize to someone who makes cookies and they enter the cookies in the baking competitions. Photography. Yeah, yeah, lots and lots of categories to enter. It's really fun if you are somebody who is a, a craftsperson, you yeah. like to craft or quilt or take photos. If you're a gardener, there's plenty of opportunities to, to put out your... Um, your crafts and your goods for exhibition and actually to receive some money as yeah. a result of that. Yeah, our premiums are pretty good too. Yeah, yeah. Win. So it's yeah. it's a it's a fun, fun thing. And for us, what we really care about is that we see people entering in the horticulture and agricultural sections, right? We want to see exactly. people enter their house plants, yeah. uh, vegetables that they've grown in their garden this summer. So tell us a little bit about that, Julie. Well you could bring there's categories for cut flowers. So if your um, zinnias are gorgeous this year, you could bring in your prize zinnias. There's categories for uh, floral arrangements. So if you throw those together in a vase and you fit within the um, guideline for that arrangement, there's different guidelines that you can enter like, um, you know, a, a walk in the forest or something, whatever it is that describes what the arrangement should look like. You can win that as well. So it's really about fun competition from things from the garden. Then you can enter your watermelon. You can enter your corn. Mm -hmm. You can enter your tomatoes. Um, and, and Josh, that might be a good place to start segueing into the heat is to talk about tomatoes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we encourage you to, to consider uh, participating, especially if you are here in the Oklahoma City Metro consider participating in our county fair or a county fair, yep. uh, enter something you've grown, something that you've you've done this this year and win some premium money. Yep. It's always a fun time and always a good good chance to uh, take advantage of this opportunity. So, so uh, I was wondering about the, with the heat and the drought, whether we'll have any tomatoes at the fair is what I was gonna say. Yeah, it'll be an yeah. interesting year, that's for sure. I, you know, I haven't been in horticulture and working in this world as long as you have, Julia, but I've been, I can remember the last major drought cycle that right. we had that, that mirrors kind of what we're dealing yeah. with right now, which would be yeah. the 2011, 2012 yep. period and um, really wreaked a lot of havoc in terms of, um, yeah, of course, people's vegetable production in their backyards. But when we think about landscapes, when we think about um, Bermuda grass lawns, Bermuda and, grass lawns yeah. and irrigation, um, ra water rationing that, that came out of that, a lot, a lot of uh, issues that. Um, we face when we start having multiple months where our temperatures are yeah. well above 100 degrees consistently and we have very little rainfall. Yep, like um, record, really, the uh, record drought. I, I think I shed a little slide here, those of you that are watching us. Yeah, so... Oh, we, there is, yeah. <laughs> we always talk about our fact sheets. Julia, what's the website? Facts.okstate.edu. You got it I can this time. never remember that. <laughs> so, of course, yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, definitely check check out our fact sheet website as usual yep. where resources yep. like this are found. But this cracks, these cracks, right. that's, that could be easily our state. Well, I, I can say I have areas of my yard. If, again, if you're watching on YouTube, we're showing a picture here of some dry, barren ground with lots and lots of cracks in it, um, especially clay soils. They mm -hmm. tend to do they this when they're really, up. really dry. Yeah. I have some areas yeah. like this in, in my yard. So, uh, yeah, we are facing... Um, 
drought through most of this region across yeah. the state and, and really record uh, temperatures in some in some uh, places and so well what I was going to mention about the tomatoes real quick is that we're getting this call in the office a lot that people's plants are just stalling you yeah. know they and then at temperatures above 96 degrees it, uh, the pollen just it burns up and it can't get to you know it can't make tomatoes the pollen there's no pollen so that's why you're having this lack of fruit set down. As soon as we have a cool down, your tomatoes can reset. So don't give up on them, but they may not set fruit in this high, high fruit, in this real high temperature. Yeah, I feel like a lot of plants are probably just going to be hunkering down and surviving yeah. right now. And yeah, so and hopefully they make it through the heat. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Even the flowers and stuff will stall at this temperature. With, with adequate irrigation, they just can't keep up with the heat. But keeping things wet is really important. Try, you know, maybe trying soaker hoses. Uh, if you don't have that, you could you can put soaker hoses out if you want to on flower beds or whatever. If you've just been trying to keep them wet with a sprinkler and it's not working well enough. Um, just really trying to baby the plants along. Yeah. And that's the main garden activity. I will talk in just a minute about fall gardening and okay. getting ready for that. But do you want to talk about lawns? Yeah, so... As Julia said, irrigation is is really critical um, right now here in in Oklahoma, especially as we we're facing uh, extreme temperatures. Um, irrigation is not always something that we say. Uh, it, it's one of those things that is really so dependent upon climate and weather. And sometimes we can get by without it. Um, right now, irrigation is going to be needed to keep um, a lot of your landscape plants and certainly your vegetable gardens going. And so. Um, anything you can do to do that and do it efficiently. So drip irrigation, soaker hoses are great ways to do that. Was it, wasn't it you telling, someone was telling me this morning, I can't remember if it was you or not, Josh, that they're already doing water rationing in parts of, around the area. Yeah, so, yes, many communities across the, across the region are starting to look at uh, putting some uh, restrictions in terms of when people and use when water. water. So there's, a, there's, of course, the odd even watering that's right. always in effect. Always. But some communities are, are, facing the possibility of even um, stricter water right. restrictions. So yeah. certainly um, we need some rain. Can I mention this, Josh? Because um, a lot of people don't know this, but on turf grass, like Bermuda grass, it can go completely summer dormant. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's not going to come yeah. back. It's, a, it's alive, but it's dormant, right? Yeah, yeah. So right now, if you haven't been irrigating your lawn uh, with the temperatures we've had here in Oklahoma, you probably have a very crusty dry golden lawn and it looks dead yeah. it looks like it does in the winter dead. right yes. it looks like it does as we're coming out of uh into early december or in january february um that golden crusty uh look, you would think it was done you for would think it was done for but if we get a good rain then it will green up in yeah. time and so that's going to come back in the thing. fall too. yeah that's the beautiful yeah. thing about uh our warm season lawns uh specifically Things like Bermuda grass or buffalo grass is that's their that's actually their drought response mechanism. Yeah. Right? yeah. So Bermuda grass survival has um, a couple different ways that it that it approaches um, dry soils in terms of making sure it survives. So it can um, it can grow uh, laterally with its stolons and its rhizomes to try to find more water put on deeper roots, um, but it can also go dormant. So when yeah. the soils are as dry as they are. What happens with those warm season turf grasses? Yeah. They actually enter a state of dormancy. Yeah. Um, they shut down, and they're basically just waiting for the right moisture conditions to, to to be able to grow again. So this is a weird question, but as someone that doesn't, I don't maintain a real highly maintained lawn, but I do see neighborhoods, you know, near, that are drive by on the way home and stuff, and you can see where they watered a little bit, and it's green, but beyond that, <laughs> it's that crispy brown. Do we have a recommendation? Do, do you? Do you let it go, do you, or is it just a matter of personal choice? Well, I think it's always a matter of personal choice. Uh, I will tell you, I have a large um, landscape area. I have over an acre of, of lawn space, and I personally have chosen not to irrigate all that. It's I just don't. It's just cost prohibitive. Yeah. Um, but I have certainly been watering trees, especially younger yeah, trees younger that trees. are planted. Um, my, my landscape beds, um, I have done. Now, some people might decide they want to carve out an area of lawn space close to the house. If you've got a smaller lot, maybe you're irrigating the whole yeah. the whole lot. But it can become a real challenge, especially if you don't have an automatic sprinkler right. system in the ground and you're you trying to it. manage with you know, sprinklers. Hoses. That can be a very, very yeah. big job. Um, so whatever your preference is, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. But 
I would say it's okay to let it go dormant. Um, it's not going to hurt it's it. It's not going to hurt it. It may not be as appealing. Maybe you decide in a, uh, maybe this, the, you decide I'm going to water my front lawn so it looks good from the street, yeah. but maybe I let my backyard go dormant and, and let that yeah, go. Good idea. There's, there's different options and it all is going to come down to personal preference, but, um, you know, in order to keep your, your grass green with the temperatures we've had, it's, it's going to have require some water and water is, um, becoming more and more expensive all the time. Right. And so certainly we have to make choices when it comes to that. Um, this, this slide you see behind us, if you're watching on YouTube, is a slide that we show sometimes when we're doing programs. And it's kind of uh, mirrors information that you'll find in one of our fact sheets. This one would, would uh, mirror some information you'd find in our Bermuda grass lawn management calendar. And it basically shows you mesonet data from the Spencer Mesonet site here near our extension office. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the Mesonet, it stands for, the, um, well, it, it is basically a weather monitoring network that is a partnership between OSU and OU and the National Weather Center in Norman. And they collect data from all over the state. We have multiple weather stations in each county and they're collecting real-time data every five minutes that, that gets updated. And that information is utilized so that we can actually um, make really specific recommendations in terms of lawn water and your crop, crop management and things like that. So this chart here that you're, you're seeing, this table here, um, shows the 12 months of the year. It shows in the first, the first column how much water Bermuda grass needs based on this historic 30-year period of time. Um, shows the Bermuda grass water needs. Um, and so I've zoomed in here on June, July, and August. For the month of August, Bermuda grass is going to need 4.3 inches of rainfall. To stay green. To, to really stay green and, yeah. and kind of that lush, normal yeah. um, quality that we would expect from yeah. a nice yeah. lawn. Um, we get about 3.3 inches of average precipitation. This is that 1998 to 2018 data. Right. Um, we get about 3.3 inches of average precipitation in the month of August. So we have about a one inch deficit. So in order to really keep that that green aesthetic uh, look and feel that we would want with turf grass, we're going to yeah. have about a one inch um, of, of irrigation that we're going to have to put out in, in addition to any natural rainfall that we During now, the this week. Is, yeah, during the week. Now, yeah. this is historic information. Now, we're certainly drier. Um, and hotter than we have been in a number of years. And so for this year, I would expect that number to be to be higher. Higher, because it's evaporating, right? right? We, we're yeah. having hotter, drier temperatures. But in general, um, the month of August, you're going to need about one inch of supplemental irrigation okay. for the month. Now, what does that okay. look like if you've got an automatic sprinkler system? That would be about one to about one hour of runtime for your sprinkler system yeah. in, in general. So if you think about that, you're going to put out a, a, an inch over the course of the month, chop up an hour of runtime yeah. over four weeks minute for the segments, month, right? 20 minute yeah. segments and once or twice a week over the course of the month. Yeah. And that is typically enough to keep a lawn functional. Um, certainly when we're as hot as we're in, and as dry as we are now, that may end up being um, something that now, you have to put a lot more Now, into. what about your cool season grasses? That you just mm -hmm. have to kind of give up on or what? So we do, we do have cool season grasses that we can manage here in Oklahoma. And certainly those are going to be typically more in a shaded setting. Those, yeah. That's going to be the most yeah. common application for those. So in a full sun setting, Tall fescue is going to take a beating in these temperatures. It's yeah. going to be lucky to, or to even a, even a partial sun. Huh? Even a partial sun. Yeah. So in a full, so depending on the situation that you have, if you've got a, a heavy shaded area that has lot a lot lower evaporative loss, right. um, And you're irrigating, you can probably limp it along and keep it looking nice. But in a full sun setting, it's be it's going to require a lot, a lot, a lot of water. If you look at if you're again watching here on YouTube and you look at um, basically for tall fescue. We have almost three times as much water need. So here in the month of August, it's high, we get that we have about a six point four inch lot of water. need. Yeah, for for tall fescue, and we get three point three inches. So we have about a three inch uh, need, which is going to be three times the amount of water yeah. that, that would be required for the grass. So. Ooh. Really, when we're thinking about a cool season lawn that we're trying to limp through this hottest, driest period yeah. of the summer, 
It's a lot of inputs. Well, so here's the million dollar question though. It, that's not going to return for you as well as Bermuda grass, is it? I mean, I'm not. It's not going to kill it out completely, but you're going right. to. You'll have a lot of loss. Overseen. You won't have it completely die back, probably, but you'll have a, a major thinning out. And so this fall, say mid September into early mid October, yeah. uh, or next spring, you would need to do some overseed. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to remind everybody to water your feathered friends and your insect friends. Um, if you're like me and I feed the birds year round, I've, I've really realized that there's a lot of birds in my landscape and they live there because I feed them. Um, but especially in, in, in urban environments where they're going from area to area looking for worms or maybe they've got bird seed in somebody's yard or whatever. What people tend to forget to do is put water out for yeah. them. Yeah. And I know you may not have a fancy, you don't have to have a fancy $300 bird bath, you know, with the fountain and everything. You can just turn a pot over and put a saucer on top of it and fill it full of water. Put a couple rocks in there. If you put a couple rocks in there, the birds can land easier. And so can pollinators like bees and uh, butterflies. They can get on that rock and then they can go down and get, get to the moisture. Mm -hmm. But it's been so hot and dry. Josh, there, like I made the joke the other day that, you know, when you turn, sometimes when you have where your water's at, where you turn it on and the water leaks sometimes like it does at my house and it accumulates. I mean, I see when I haven't got water in the yard somewhere, I'll see the birds bathing in that little tiny yeah. pool of water. Oh, yeah. They're desperately looking mm -hmm. for water to cool off and uh, same thing with insects. So I just yeah. wanted to mention that. And then I was also going to mention that fall gardening starts in vegetable gardening starts in August, a little bit in July. I'm not going to go way into that, but um, and it's a, it's one of those times because it's still re often really hot, and we yeah. may still be limping along plants from our our early summer plantings um, that people sometimes forget about. They don't think about yeah. the, the opportunity for a fall vegetable garden, and it actually doesn't sound very fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to go out and plant squash and to, and start put some fall tomatoes in or whatever. But this fact sheet from OSU, this fall gardening fact sheet, is excellent because it tells you exactly the windows of timing mm -hmm. of when you want to plant. And I wanted to um, go ahead and uh, plug a little bit for a workshop that I have coming up that's all about vegetables too in in. Uh, it's called homegrown, but we have a slide on that in just a minute. I was going to remind you, if you are planting seeds, it always helps to soak them mm -hmm. because the ground's so dry. So if you'll soak them overnight, especially big seeds like beets or, um, uh, oh, it's too late to plant okra, but big seeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What am I thinking of? Everything I'm thinking of is small. Corn, mm -hmm. slightly for corn, but big seeds. If you'll soak them, they'll, beans, beans, that's a good one. They'll imbibe with water and then they'll germinate two to three times, yeah. two to three days faster than they would otherwise. So soak so your tip. seeds. Yep. Yeah. Um, remember that if you're not going to be growing any produce this summer or if you're not getting a lot of produce because the garden's burning up, the East Side Farmers Market, our local market gardeners, have got all kinds of great stuff. Um, I bought something the other night that I didn't have in my garden. Oh, I, I didn't plant any zucchini and I was hungry for zucchini. I got some gorgeous zucchinis the other night. Uh, but that is from 4 to 7 p.m. on Tuesday evenings here yeah, at the Extension we're, we're really glad to have that market here, 4 to 7 p.m. every Tuesday evening, Eastside Fresh Market here at the Oklahoma County OSU Extension Office, 2500 Northeast 63rd. Definitely check that out. Yep, and then I was just going to promote this um, homegrown workshop I have. It's uh, Thursday, September the 1st. You can enroll in it right now. Um, it's free to the public and it should be a great workshop, but it's all about how to grow vegetables in period. It's everything from how to improve your soils. I've had people say, well, why are you doing a vegetable gardening class in the beginning of the fall? But it will really help you if you had a rough year this year and you mm -hmm. want to learn more, how to, everything you can do during the winter to make a good garden. But plus I'll also be covering how to do, uh, well, you'll be helping me, but we'll be covering how to do um, the things that you do in the fall, like composting mm -hmm. and also soil improvement and also still how to plant all the fall vegetables. There's time. Yeah, we'll give you all the tips that you need so that you can prepare and plan now for success next year. In and the whole next, next year. year. Yeah. yeah. And, there's, and there's still plenty that can be done September and onward. Yeah, to grow yeah stuff. you can still grow a lot of stuff. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, thank you, Julia. And um, for those of you out there listening, uh, keep, keep gardening, keep... Uh, Keep watering, and uh, we'll survive this hot, hot heat. Yes, stay and, cool, <laughs> and we will we will see better times ahead. Keep listening. Um, please do 
uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, continue to um, listen to the Urban Gardener podcast as we put out content. And uh, thank you for listening.